So, okay, so I've got, I thought what I would talk to you about tonight, uh, today, this afternoon, is uh, uh, what you're really going to hear is you're going to um, see my thinking over the past six, seven years of really how I view uh, the whaling story and um, um, how I put her in context for myself, because I think in order to be able to talk about the story, you need to clearly pull out uh, themes uh, um, that we think are relevant. So uh, a lot of what you're seeing is you're, you're, you're seeing my own manifestation of ideas uh, as I tried to learn this story when I came here seven years ago. So uh, we'll run about 45 minutes. Does that sound pretty good? Uh, I know the docents have got their notepads and they are going to be correcting me tomorrow and that's why I'm going to be getting on a plane to Cape Verde tomorrow. <laughs> so, uh, how's that? Is that a little better? Okay. Uh, can we turn up the volume on the microphone, uh, Bob? Thanks. So, okay, the first slide that we have here is uh, the corporate seal. I wanted to show it to you mostly because it says uh, 1903. Of course, this was towards the end of the whaling era, but most notice, notably when the artist was choosing the image, it wasn't necessarily a, a glorified image of killing the whale. I mean, here is in many ways the whale uh, going after and putting uh, humans in harm's way. I thought it's an interesting uh, reflection of perhaps some of the values and certainly some of the dangers uh, which um, um, lead to the story that we largely tell at the museum, which is this heroic uh, uh, period in the age of sail. Uh, now this painting, which is on view in the new exhibit, Energy and Enterprise, that I think you're going to have a look at right after the show, uh, <coughs> in many ways tells uh, the story of what is happening in New Bedford. And so this is a very good place to start when we look at commerce uh, and industry, uh, business acumen, and why New Bedford uh, propelled itself to uh, be essentially the capital of whaling and uh, just a little bit more on that in a moment. But uh, Nantucket was, as we know, and by the way, I apologize for those who know all this before uh, um, I talk, but uh, I'll, I'll try to skip over some of the more obvious points. Um, so sometime around 1820 or thereabouts, uh, uh, New Bedford really picked up its game. And what we see in this painting by William Allen Wall are a number of very interesting points. And uh, the reason why it's one of my favorite paintings in the museum is because it talks to why New Bedford uh, rose to prominence. What you have here is a very large and protected harbor. Uh, the large, deep, protected harbor was critical for the number of uh, vessels. As we all know, that as the vessels got larger, New Bedford increasingly lost its competitive advantage because the hulls uh, uh, displaced more war water, and if anybody has sailed into New in New. In, in, did I say New Newport? I, I meant to say Nantucket. Uh, as, as we all know, if you sail into Nantucket, um, it's very shoaly, uh, and that was a severe problem uh, as these whale vessels uh, got much larger and deeper. Uh, the second thing is you see trees, and if you've been to Nantucket, you don't see too many trees. And if you're going to be building these great uh, bluffed, bowed barks with the frequency that they were kicked out between Mattapoisid and Westport, you needed a lot of tree and lumber and oak. Thirdly, you see people. And with the uh, migration to uh, New Bedford uh, and the need for um, uh, sailors, uh, um, that certainly helped. Uh, fourthly, uh, you needed easy access to markets and when in Nantucket, if you just come back from the Pacific and you unloaded your oil, well, you still have to get it from Nantucket to the mainland. But isn't it curious that there is a red train uh, pulling out right in the middle of the painting, and here we are talking about South Coast Rail today, but isn't it interesting that uh, one of the key reasons why New Bedford rose to rapid prominence... Thanks a lot. Uh, to rapid prominence was because of easy access to markets. Now, let's have a look at a couple of other things in this painting. That is the textile mills on the left-hand side. Uh, the textile mills uh, uh, drew many immigrants to the community. As a matter of fact, if you look at 
populations in the US just over a 100 year period, uh, you'll see it going from about uh, 10 million to uh, uh, about 100 million uh, from um, about 17, uh, from uh, 1830s to, uh, uh, to 1930s, thereabouts. Uh, and you also see the shift from um, rural into the cities uh, earlier, obviously, uh, the vast preponderance of folks um, in rural settings, uh, but that's skewing almost to 50-50 by the time you get to 1930s, thereabouts. And one of the, in, in the South Coast case, whether it's Fall River or here, Uh, Bob, can we try turning up the volume a little bit more? Yeah. And uh, I'm just working on a bit of a hoarse throat, too. I was just in San Diego giving a number of lectures. So I'll, I'll, I'll try talking. Is that a little bit better now? Okay, great. So uh, we have the textile mills. You can see also in the painting uh, the large number of sticks uh, in the harbor, which uh, is obviously a reference to uh, the whaling industry and the vast number of uh, whaling barks, but also have a look at the cathedral. And it's often been said that one way to measure the value in a society is to look at what are the tallest buildings. Uh, cathedrals, or in Florence, it's Medici's Tower, or perhaps today with commerce with uh, World Trade Center and uh, large buildings like that. But you see that the French Canadians made a major push to have this being the center, uh, the uh, diocesan center, and uh, that's hence the, uh, the large cathedral. So uh, this painting tells us a lot, and perhaps finally, you can clearly see that because of the bucolic setting, uh, that there is time for leisure, uh, as exemplified here with the lady with the parasol. Okay, uh, just quickly to touch on this slide, our connection with Wales obviously goes back into time, back, back into uh, mythological time. We can think of our own relationship with Wales as we go back to Jonah, St. Brendan here, and uh, uh, of course, when you think about how whales were represented, it really was until the 18th or 19th century, and it was largely through the work of the, uh, uh, the sailors coming back from whaling voyages that we were able to get a good idea of what whales actually looked like, as opposed to these leviathans and monsters of the deep. And this is what it was all about. It was all about commerce, and sometime, it, well, in uh, 1750s, uh, a Portuguese Sephardic Jew came from Portugal to New York and made his way to Newport. And he had uh, what essentially was proprietary technology. He, uh, much the same as possibly uh, Pfizer today with uh, Viagra. Uh, he, uh, he um, and, and the specific uh, technology that he had was the ability to take uh, spermaceti which uh, uh, people knew all about for, for, for centuries, uh, but he was able to figure out how to turn it into a candle. And so today, we still use the term lumen, but lumen, as you can see, is really from burning 120 grains of wax. Now, a little bit more on this uh, chap who came to Newport. It was the first monopoly in the colonies, and uh, that that monopoly lasted for uh, uh, five or six or so years. Uh, and then just like many other um, um, uh, uh, um, secret uh, technologies, it uh, gradually uh, dissipated and more people figured out how to make uh, sp uh, uh, spermaceti candles. So I put this slide in because the story goes from uh, the time of Jonah all the way up to today. And isn't it curious that in the 1960s, it was NASA that was purchasing the largest amount of whale oil in the US. We have asked uh, friends and contacts at the Jet Propulsion Lab in California to find out whether any whale additives were put into some of the vessels and uh, uh, vehicles which are in the remotest portions of space uh, and uh, we're, 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 it's not conclusive, it's not looking likely, but it is possible in talking to uh, George Mark at Nye Lubricants, who's been looking into this for us, that uh, perhaps some whale oil back in the 60s or 70s could have been used as an additive 
and uh, I, I put in the satellite, it's a weather satellite. Maybe that's Voyager, maybe that's Voyager on the right-hand side. Uh, but uh, George's industry, uh, Nile Lubricants, it's the largest running, continuously running business in the area from 1840s all the way to today. And today that specialized oil that they make, which is synthetic, is uh, used in uh, weather satellites and a number of other applications. So whaling ports, of course, it wasn't just Yankee, but here are a couple of the Yankee ones. And uh, the point at the bottom is particularly important. Between 1768 and 1772, whale oil accounted for 53% of the sterling by export to Great Britain. So whaling as an industry was critical to a young nation. Well, it wasn't a young nation at this point, but it was certainly critical to the colonies, and it was certainly critical to a young nation after 76. But the story goes back to Dutch times, as we know, not to belabor this, uh, but only to show that shoreside whaling and, uh, 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 has been going on for a long time. Here is Dutch uh, whaling off the coasts of uh, uh, up north in Spitzenber uh, Spitsbergen. Uh, and there, obviously, we know what happens here. You catch the whale. Uh, you're not rendering the whale uh, blubber on board, so you have to relatively quickly get it to shore before, uh, uh, before it goes rancid, and they're rendering it on shore. Uh, the invention that the Yankees brought to the table was the ability to render the oil on board the vessels, which allowed them to stay out for so long. So you were tied with shoreside whaling, uh, um, to um, these uh, uh, coastal uh, toeholds, whether it was in Brazil, whether it was in Spitsbergen, whether it was in California, or in this case, whether it was Cal uh, Japan. So uh, we wonder why the Japanese might be whaling today. Well, they've been whaling for a long time, as, we've know, as we know. It was also General MacArthur who encouraged the Japanese after World War II to go back whaling, because when your population is starving, and this was uh, a pursuit which has been in the customs and traditions of your country for a long time. It seemed a logical way to feed people. But what is noticeable about this Hiroshigi print is the sheer industry that's involved. Men and women, uh, flensing here, a whale. You can see others uh, uh, out in the bay. And uh, you can see that this is quite a pursuit. Uh, some parallels here with Azorian whaling, where uh, because the whales come close to shore, there's no need to build those uh, bluff-bowed barks. Uh, what you need are lookouts, and then you send out whale boats to corral and kill. And of course, they're flensing the whale here. This is a baleen whale, as you can see. Now, uh, uh, this, isn't, uh, this is John Garfield, our uh, former chair, uh, chairman, and uh, Janet Whitla is here, who was chair before John. Uh, but this isn't a photograph of John. Uh, by the way, his last name is Garfield, goes back to President James Garfield. But I wanted to show you uh, this model of the Dartmouth, because when New Bedford, well, when Bedford Village uh, was uh, founded by Roach, uh, he was going in competition with many of the merchants in Boston, and he was trying to cut out the middlemen and export directly to England, which he did. So a stone's throw from here, he built the first large vessel uh, in Bedford Village, and he appropriately called it Dartmouth. And the Dartmouth set sail uh, for England, and it returned to Boston Harbor with tea, and it was off the Dartmouth that uh, they tossed the tea into Bedford, into uh, Boston Harbor. Now, I was talking to um, uh, a colleague who is related to Roach, and uh, she went through the letters, and uh, she surmised that uh, Roach was kind of playing it both ways, uh, that he was, selling, uh, he was selling his whale oil in England, and he was getting paid for the tea that he brought back, but when he got into Boston Harbor, he wrote a very cordial note to Samuel Adams, uh, letting him know that he was going to be off the boat for the better part of eight hours, and it was going to be unguarded, and he just hoped that everything would be OK. <laughs> so to continue just a theme, I'm just back from San Diego, and we think 
New Bedford whaling. But it's important to look at it from the point of view of the country. And there are something like 18 or thereabouts different whaling stations up and down the coast. This one in Carmel, but uh, there's two in San Diego. And they run up and they're dotted up and down the coast, particularly in California. And um, the uh, people who founded these whaling stations uh, were very often uh, people who had gone on whaling voyages, or uh, whale ships, whale barks, and probably got off in San Francisco because they were quite eager to seek gold. And a cheap and easy passage was to take a whale boat to a whale ship to, uh, uh, to uh, San Francisco. And uh, we all know about the number of whaling barks which were abandoned. Uh, but when they couldn't find gold, uh, by the way, there's some funny stories uh, that when you got off the dock in San Francisco, that uh, you had to watch where you walked because there were all these potholes and people <laughs> thought that literally gold was everywhere. So as soon as they hopped off the vessel, <laughs> they would dig for gold. <laughs> and so there are these potholes as people are digging for gold. But as we know, that was a very difficult, difficult uh, pursuit and many people um, uh, had uh, 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 trouble eking out uh, uh, a living. And so they reverted to what they were doing prior. And if you were Portuguese, uh, you were very good at uh, farming and also fishing, whaling, and you went back to those pursuits. And so indeed, many of the whale fisheries up and down the coast of California were, uh, uh, were run by uh, Portuguese. Um, and here, uh, Bob Rocha, who's operating the uh, machine for me here with our advanced technology, uh, um, it was on the phone with our friends from Barrow, Alaska, and he had to get off the phone uh, because there was a eureka moment when they saw their first bowhead whale, and they said, it's time to end this conference call. We've got to run out and catch our first whale. And uh, uh, here is a, a photograph, not of that particular moment, but similar. So whaling is still going on today. OK, back to business. <clears throat> this is a slide which shows the perfect bell curve of an industry. Uh, I'll go into a little bit more detail than I usually do uh, during these uh, uh, presentations just because of the topic. But I, and I put in some key dates. As you can tell, uh, wars are really never a very good thing, uh, particularly during the uh, age of sail. Uh, redcoats attacked, but also it was uh, not good for commerce. Uh, same thing with uh, the War of 1812 through 15, and uh, not good for commerce either, both uh, onshore where stores and uh, property was destroyed, but also vessels at sea were seized. Uh, the railroad was complete that we were talking about earlier in the, uh, uh, oh, around the 40s, give or take. Uh, somebody here will know better, surely. And then we can see uh, Wamsutta Mill was capitalized and the California gold rush all started around the late 1845s through 55 period. And uh, we can see also that is when the uh, height of whaling occurred in New Bedford with over 329 vessels uh, just, from, uh, just from New Bedford alone. So then the shock occurred. Uh, this black stuff spouted up in Titusville, Pennsylvania. And who did they look to but uh, the refiners from New Bedford? Uh, we all know the Howland family. It was uh, many Howlands who went to uh, Pennsylvania to help refine the whale oil. And then there were the various shocks to the market with the crushing of the ice. Uh, um, there's a NOAA expedition to uh, the north coast of Alaska this summer, and uh, it's because of some reconnoitering in the past two years, and they're going to track down and see if they can find uh, um, some artifacts from uh, the crushing in uh, certainly 1871, and I think it's 1876, they're finding some of the uh, um, remnants uh, of those vessels. Uh, and whaling had a boost an unnatural boost, uh, no pun intended, because, and as we all know, it's the women's fault, and that is because of the desire for corsets. And this is before 
spring steel was invented, and it was before plastic, obviously, and you needed a strong, fibrous material. And this unusual and bizarre desire to have a perfect V-shape meant that it wasn't the, in a curious flip, it was no longer the blubber from a whale, which was important, but rather the baleen. And that gave it an unusual uh, burst of uh, excitement in the 70s, but that soon ran out in the 80s. Uh, with the invention of uh, uh, spring steel when it doomed the market. Then the big bad Norwegians come into the game. Now, a point here, uh, there was a paper that uh, came out from the museum and others about a month ago, written, uh, co-authored by our science director. And one of the points, and I think it's a really a critical point from this museum in terms of how we view ourselves, and that is that if you look at about, um, at two or three centuries of uh, Yankee whaling, and you do a count, as best we can, uh, probably an interpolation of the number of whales which were killed, uh, it, was, it took only three seasons in the 20th century to kill as many whales. So uh, if you're walking around with a chip on your shoulder that we're killing whales, uh, don't feel so badly, um, but it is remarkable uh, that in just three seasons in the 20th century with foreign vessels uh, that um, as many whales were killed. And of course, this uh, went down for the, uh, the better part of uh, uh, nearly three quarters of a century uh, before uh, strenuous uh, laws came in uh, to try to protect uh, the marine animals. And then here we are in 1928 uh, with uh, the last whale uh, vessel leaving New Bedford. Another way to look at this is, this is looking at departures. This was a chart put together by Judy Lund for me. It's the departure of American offshore whaling vessels. And this is simply comparing New Bedford to all other ports. So it tells exactly the same story. It shows market dominance. It shows uh, a perfect bell curve. Uh, it, uh, it, it shows how New Bedford uh, had that critical mass in terms of uh, uh, what an industry required to be very dominant in one uh, particular area. Now, this complicated uh, slide is of interest to me. And uh, see, I'm going to try to move this thing so I can read it. Okay. So. This is based, uh, some of you may be familiar with uh, uh, Porter. Uh, David, I, I'm sure you know uh, uh, Michael Porter. And he uses a, uh, it's, it's, it's a way to look at your business. And the idea is you look at suppliers on one side and you look at buyers on another side. And then you look at threats and you put yourself in the middle. And so uh, we applied this in this rough measure to whaling. And uh, so if we look at the supply of, uh, uh, the laws of supply and demand, we know that the uh, demand for head matter, which was, uh, um, uh, let's just focus on uh, the spermaceti here. The demand for head matter exceeded the ability of the colonial whalers to supply. So that's a fact. And even though the number of vessels which were being built, they weren't able to meet capacity. So the result was, as we talked about earlier, this first monopoly which developed. So let's have a look at the, the actors involved. We've got uh, three sets of actors. We've got the suppliers. These are the whalemen, the folks that go out to kill and bring back the product. We've got the merchants, uh, domestic consumption uh, or overseas. And then we have manufacturers. Uh, giving value added to a product. And then let's see what happens when we put this into a market context. So in the middle, you've got us, people like us, the discriminating buyers. And so in the colonies or in England, there's price sensitivity. We only want to buy what we can afford. Uh, there are also cheaper, often inferior substitutes. So that's where, that is where the... Um, that's where the market is. So on the manufacturer side, on the right-hand side, we have spermaceti candle making used proprietary technology as described. The goals there 
One, you want to keep your process secret, right? If you're the only one who knows how to do it, you want to keep this secret for as long as possible. You want to limit the competition. You don't want other people. You don't want Apple competing with Samsung, competing with uh, Microsoft. You want to be the only one out there. And you also need to control the price of the raw product. You don't want those whalemen charging an outrageous price such that when you put value added to it, you're not getting a lot from it. And you also want to control the finished product price. But the challenges that they faced, the trade secrets got out, the manufacturers increased exponentially, and it was very difficult to enforce the terms of a trust. There was a spermaceti trust when there were five or six or seven actors involved, but it was very difficult to enforce those terms. Now, let's have a look at the merchant. Okay, so that's one side, that's manufacturers. Let's have a look at the merchants. These are the middlemen. By the way, one of the merchants is uh, John Hancock. He did a pretty good job later, but he didn't do so well up in Boston when he was in the whaling game. They wanted to control supply, but it was pretty costly to do so. They were controlling the supply by paying the um, uh, whalemen a lot of money for their, their product, but of course then they weren't making as much. And their challenge was first to market. If they were second or third, if their ship got in late into London or Paris, and somebody, uh, there were other countries uh, that were killing whale, uh, beat them, it would push down the price and they weren't able to make a profit. So it was in this particular, um, it was with this particular configuration that New Bedford came to the fore. So on the suppliers, on the left hand, on, on uh, uh, my left hand side, uh, uh, my right hand side rather, uh, so primarily Nantucket, later New Bedford. So there are two options. Either you sidestep the merchant and trade directly overseas, as we talked about, uh, with the Dartmouth, for instance, and possibly vertically integrate. You catch the whale, you make the candles, and you have all those businesses shoreside. And that indeed is what happened in New Bedford. You had all of this concentration of related businesses which allowed for vertical integration and dominance in the field, which allowed them to push out the manufacturers and the merchants. That clear as mud? David, uh, how was that for Brown Economics 101? Close enough, good. That, that's okay, it's a history museum. Okay, now <clears throat> this will challenge any mathematician. And I just love the way this kind of logarithmically increases in number. In the 1800s, thousands of whale ships with tens of thousands of men killed hundreds of thousands of whales by traveling millions of miles for tens of millions of gallons of oil for hundreds of millions of profits. And then if you ever want a great example of swords to plowshares, try whaling, because now it's businesses like ours that are thriving on telling the story. Now here's another mathematical model in the 1850s, and this is obviously the sperm whale that's up in our gallery. It's, uh, let's just assume it's a 60 barrel bull. 60 barrel bull would be the number of barrels of oil you would get from a bull whale, bull sperm. And let's say you get 45 catches. So you get 45 bull whale a year. And then there's this number of gallons per barrel. And then you multiply that by $2.55 a gallon, which is uh, about the price of gas now, but it was the price of a gallon uh, then in 1850, and you multiply that by uh, the CPI, which is pretty inaccurate number uh, when you go back that much in time, but you get a lot of money. So there's an awful lot of money to be made in this business. That's the, that's the main point from this slide. And if you have this many barrels, you're going to be doing quite well. Now, I mentioned that there was another mini peak and this is not grass. This, these are palm fronds. Uh, these are uh, baleen. They look like palm fronds. This is baleen in San Francisco. And you see those tall clipper ships uh, on the dock. And you can see the people walking up and down through the rows here as they're drying out the baleen. But this gives you an idea of the extent of the harvesting of the bow whale, which had much larger baleen plates. Uh, 
I'll let you read this. This is from one of our docents, David Blanchett, and uh, it's, a, it's a great cartoon, just kind of reversing <laughs> what people see. <laughs> Okay, doing so, so far so good? Yeah. All right, great, great. Um, I'm trying to be a little bit more detailed than I usually go, and I hope that's okay. Yes, ma'am. Oh, ba ah, ta 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 ta, you missed the earlier slide. Baleen is a prior to, again, prior to the invention of spring steel or plastic, you needed a, if you needed a strong, um, flexible material, baleen was perfect. So buggy whips, corsets. Um, if you think about uh, the, the Napoleonic era where they're wearing those, head, uh, those headdresses as they ride into battle, a lot, sometimes that's baleen. And it's got a host of other uses. Okay, Bartholomew Milgaz. Now we know this story very well, so I'm not gonna go into the historical story other than to say that when he did come over, uh, one of his uh, directives was to look for uh, whale, and uh, in, indeed they did see, and uh, I'm not sure whether they caught whale, uh, but it was certainly part of his charter uh, uh, when he took that expedition. And uh, the founding of the, new, well, the founding of the Old Dartmouth Historical Society was because 300 years later when this monument was put up, an organization needed to be founded too. Uh, to celebrate and uh, take care of it. And indeed, this is our property in Cuddyhunk today. And this, uh, this marble tablet, which is coming up, uh, says precisely that. The Old Dartmouth Historical Society, and it was uh, how ironic that it was Henry Huddleston Rogers who made his fortune in Standard Oil. So he'd figured out what to do with all that whale in Titusville, Pennsylvania, and elsewhere around the country. And uh, Rockefeller uh, was very responsible for driving the price of whale oil down to ridiculously low prices. As a matter of fact, um, there were instances of many whaling uh, barks uh, loaded with whale oil in San Francisco Harbor, and they were just sitting there waiting for the price to rise, and it just kept going down lower and lower and lower. Uh, and how ironic that it's Henry Huddleston Rogers that actually purchased the building where the Waddles Family Gallery is today and finding, founding the museum. This only to point out that it was in the middle of World War uh, I. This, is, this says July uh, 1918, uh, 1916 as work started, I believe, in 1915. So it was the middle of World War I that work started in the uh, Bourne building. Of course, here it is today. Uh, not to spend much time on that, we know that story, but the Morgan, uh, ironically, the plans for the Lagoda were lost, and so the Lagoda is actually built on uh, plan, uh, drawings taken from the Morgan, which was in Fairhaven at the time of the building of the Bourne building. Now, this, of course, is the map which is just behind me in the Jacobs Family Gallery. And the point I would make here, uh, obviously there's the dotting of whale throughout the globe with the different colors referring to baleen um, whale or sperm whale. But there is the there's the transcontinental railroad and that brought the capital of whaling from New Bedford over to San Francisco, and that happened after the Civil War. Here's a great cartoon in Vanity Fair. You can see the date, 1861. <laughs> they're having a good time, and they're celebrating. <laughs> it's interesting that in popular culture, they're talking about uh, preservation matters, and it was Captain Charles Scammons who was talking about preservation of whale in the uh, in, in, in um, seventeen uh, in eighteen seventy six uh, in his book, and he was aghast at the rate of the depletion of the gray whale in California that he wrote about preservation and protection measures. Okay, just. So far, so good. How are we doing? Everybody's still awake? All right, good. 
Okay, um, slightly different uh, uh, topic here, but moving again into uh, the people that did the work and uh, who was in New Bedford. On the left-hand side, uh, we have a very inspiring story with uh, Captain Paul Cuffey. And I uh, always find it uh, terrific um, when we can talk about uh, an African-American uh, and Native American who uh, back in the uh, 1790s or so, goes to Boston, writes law, is the first um, African-American person of color to meet a president, sitting president, uh, and uh, we're delighted uh, uh, to have an exhibit on him here, obviously from Westport. And Douglas, there is a reason why he came to New Bedford, and it's because of the Quaker spirit, that uh, egalitarian spirit that existed uh, in, the, in, in the town uh, um, for, uh, for many years beforehand. And it would have been known that Quakers eschewed uh, uh, slavery and uh, were abolitionists, uh, which is one of the reasons why New Bedford has always been, and still is today, uh, uh, recognized as a gateway uh, city and uh, uh, port uh, uh, to welcome. Uh, people and, and something uh, just a little bit more on that in a minute. This painting came to us from a the art reviewer for the New York Times, and she picked it up at a yard sale. It's a William Allen Wall painting, and she donated it to us. And I wanted to show it to you for a couple of reasons. It's quite symbolic. It's painted in 1850, and we believe it is a response by the abolitionist Wall uh, to the Refugee Act. And you can see what's happening here. It's sunrise, and it's red sun in the morning, shepherd's warning, right? So there's a sense that danger is coming. And you have a chap wearing a red hat. It's the Fijian hat, and that is the cap of liberty, uh, the lady coming over the barricades in France, and he's wearing that red hat. And you can see that there's a man of color there, and he is raising a sail in an optimistic, positive act with his friends. There's another vessel coming along and there's another red flag there, but there's this ominous gallows, right? It's probably a davit, but it just seems unusually poignant to be right in the middle of a painting, uh, a gallows. So we, we think this is a painting which is a direct response to that refugee act, which he would have found quite offensive. And here is, uh, uh, don't they look very proud, uh, coming or going, uh, I'm not quite sure. Um, this is uh, Antoine uh, Silva, I believe. Uh, do I have the name right, Bob? Is that, uh, Ed no, it's Edwards, isn't it? This is Edwards on board uh, one of his vessels. And in terms of uh, an industry, whaling was a true meritocracy. It was one where it didn't really matter the color of your skin. What really mattered was your capabilities. And uh, to that point, you can look to Moby Dick, and you can see that Ishmael was not, um, uh, he wasn't the captain of the vessel. As a matter of fact, there was Tashkigo and Dragoo, and there were uh, other individuals uh, from Africa, Native America, uh, Native American, or uh, Islanders who outranked them, which I think is, is well, certainly is uh, um, uh, was was uh, deliberate on, on on Melville's part. Also, as we look at uh, people aspiring for the American dream, you need to look no further than Azorian and Cape Verdean story and to view the port of New Bedford essentially as the Alice Island, uh, particularly for the Cape Verdean community where over 70% of all Cape Verdeans coming to the US came via the port and they also came of their own volition, which was an interesting, which is an, uh, quite an interesting point. But towards the latter days in whaling after the turn of the century and the 20th century, the majority of vessels were captained and owned by Cape Verdeans. And of course, they would have started 50 years before that, 60 years before that, coming on as crew and deckhands. And here are uh, immigrants coming in on the packet ship Savoia, a slightly larger, well, a larger vessel than the Ernestina, 
but it would have been a similar passage. And I mentioned today, uh, uh, immigrant populations today. Here's an exhibit we had a couple of years ago uh, on Guatemalan textiles and how interesting that you have uh, the textile tradition from Portugal and the Azores and Madeira, and here you have the Guatemalan community that work in the waterfront today and do a great job, and they're exhibiting their work. Here is in continuation of the great uh, heritage and patrimony in the Azores, we asked a Cape Verde, we asked a, a Azorean boat builder to come and build a half-scale model of an Azorean vessel, and he's working with a student from the Azores and volunteers at the museum. That's on view here, and here's, an here's a race of the Azorean and Yankee whale boats, just to run through a couple of these. Uh, great uh, celebration here. The, the point, I think, is similar to the America's Cup. <laughs> we like to say that this was the Dabney Cup. We call this the Dabney Cup because of the uh, Dabney family's connection to the Azores. And uh, if you read the articles uh, of Charter with the America's Cup, it talks about friendly competition between nations. Well, it's anything but friendly. But I can tell you that the Dabney Cup is very friendly. And the same spirit exists, obviously, uh, we're not investing um, $2 billion as they do in the America's Cup. We invested $100,000. But John Pinero, who many of you know, is where he essentially got knighted here at the museum by the Secretary of State from Portugal who visited and gave him that medal that he's wearing around his neck, which is an indication of the sense of community and bonds of friendship which have been built up over five centuries as a result of this bridge of whale ships which spanned between here and the Azores. Now, life was not easy. This painting is on view in the Waddles Gallery. <clears throat> the point that a curator has made to me on many occasions, and this slide won't tell it properly, but there's a whaling bark just to the right of this iceberg. And there was this sense of manifest destiny. The uh, what I like about Bradford's painting here is not the sense that he can paint figures particularly well. They're rather wooden in actual fact. There's this dramatic landscape which uh, many painters at the time were painting the Grand Canyon or the, if you think of Bierstadt, they're painting the Tetons. Uh, uh, some New Bedford artists were going down to the Andes and coming back with these dramatic scenes. And here is Bradford going up and painting these magisterial canvases which are defying the imagination. I mean, not many, I mean, has anybody here seen a scene like this? You have to, it's incredulous. You might as well be painting a painting on Mars. And yet, throughout this desolation and destruction, and if this were painted by a European artist, you could imagine that there would be a certain sense of doom and gloom. You think of Eugene Delacroix, uh, you think of romantic death, you think of the turmoil in Europe, and it was reflected in the art. So the artist was capturing a sense at a time. Well, here, because of the sense of manifest destiny the, uh, uh, that pervaded the American spirit at the time, you can see that these Yankees, instead of being dis in despair, are pointing their way to this vessel, which will be their salvation. Some are more romantic in nature. This is about 20 years later. You can see the smokestack. I kept it in uh, because once power could go on board these wooden barks, you were no longer limited to tide and wind, and you could venture further and stay out longer. And uh, indeed, that's, that's what's happening here. A dangerous pursuit, uh, no doubt, uh, in the 18th, early 19th century, how often would you have an opportunity other than on horseback to go at about 15 miles, 18 miles an hour? Well, you had to tag on to one of these whales, and you certainly would. It must have been quite exhilarating, if not dangerous. I'm not gonna go into much detail on those, we all know that story, but this is, this is a fun piece by Bertoncini. There's a large collection of Bertoncini paintings at the San Francisco Maritime Museum, and they had figured out, unlike the earlier Bradford painting, at this point they had figured out how to uh, 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 stay up north, <coughs> stay up north longer. And you can see how they packed the ice against the hull of the vessel so it wouldn't be crushed. You could go into a harbor, 
and packed his ice against a hull, and it literally would rise up. He would lift it up as the ice uh, uh, came in and froze around it. And they're settled in for the winter. You can see that they're playing football and baseball, and they're sledding down a hill over here, and they seem to be quite at home. And that is one of the reasons why we went to San Francisco for our exhibit. Over 103,000 people saw that exhibit uh, at the Maritime Museum uh, just off Girondelli Square in San Francisco. And here's Christina, our curator, uh, in San Diego, uh, where I was just two days ago. Now, okay, I put this painting in. Now we're back to New Bedford. How much wealth came into the city? Well, one way to document that is to look at some of the businesses that it spawned. And one was uh, the business of art and craft. And this is Fritz Henry Lane, a painting that's at the Newport Art Museum. And this is the New York Yacht Club coming into New Bedford Harbor. And he was coming, they were coming into New Bedford Harbor to visit uh, Commodore Grinnell. Commodore Grinnell of New Bedford, we know the name, uh, was uh, a very wealthy man, uh, Commodore of the New York Yacht Club, and he uh, um, uh, welcomed the club in here. Uh, they came in again about four years ago as a result of the work of Paddy Jason, and uh, it's been about 100 years, so uh, 150 years. Now, we know the story of the Grinnell desk. Uh, this desk, or excuse me, the Resolute desk, uh, and not, we all know the story of the Resolute desk, right? So uh, the next slide will be of interest. This is, this is what you're not allowed to do at museums. This is the other Resolute desk that's in the US. And other than the fact that I'm afraid I've got the right mixed up with the left here, uh, from a political point of view, you can see that there's something about putting feet on desks that presidents quite like. <laughs> so I thought you'd enjoy that slide. Now, things got decidedly bad for the whale in the 20th century, what with spotter planes, what with boats going, uh, vessels going uh, quite fast and wherever they wanted, uh, and also bow-mounted artillery. Uh, and this allowed for a different whale to get caught. The Yankee whaler, when you're rowing a boat and you're able to go about 12 knots or so, uh, and the whale goes 15, you're not gonna do a very good job at catching that whale. And not only that, the blue whale, minky whales, uh, what's that? Oh, oh, sorry, I thought you were talking, boy, the acoustics in here are so good, you see. Um, so, uh, so not only can you not go as fast as the whale, but then the specific gravity of some of the whales, the minky, the fin, the blue, uh, they've got the ignominious distinction of sinking, should you kill it, uh, kill them. Uh, but this point, as I made earlier, uh, didn't stop these chaps from going out. And what they did when they killed the blue whale or these other whales which sank, they would inflate them with air. And that's why most of the photographs you see of these whales afloat, that it's, uh, and they look all blown up and bulbous, it's because they literally have been inflated with air. Oh, well, here's a picture right here. Now, my favorite of all pieces in the museum is just very small. It's about the size of a laptop. It's a very small watercolor. It's anonymous, painted in 1830. And uh, other than what is obviously going on here, which is that you kill the calf to get the mother, which is quite sad, it's quite empathetic, uh, Sebastian Smee, the art critic for the Boston Globe, focused on this painting in one of his reviews, and his point was that the whale boat with men, if it was like that Raleigh painting where the fluke tosses it up in the air and it breaks, well then, they are the calf, and metaphorically, the whaling bark is the mother coming to the rescue. And this is our fetus of a whale, which is hanging right outside. You can see what Darwin does to your uh, pelvis if you don't need gravity to work on it. This is a map of, this is charting all the whale over a period of time in Boston Harbor and looking for the best way to come into the harbor 
based on whale sightings, such that uh, you stand the least chance of having a ship strike. But nonetheless, it happens, and certainly bow strikes is one of the reasons why we have our whale skeletons in the museum, but a more ghastly way, much worse than being harpooned, which would kill a whale in a relatively short period of time, hours, uh, would be strangulation by netting, which is a constant uh, danger today. Our harbor today is switched, but nonetheless, the whale fishery, uh, the spirit of it continues. The dangers that our fishermen uh, um, uh, um, experience today are, are no different. Uh, they're going out in maybe slightly smaller vessels. Maybe they're not going out quite for so long. Well, they're not going out for so long. But nonetheless, they have the same um, dangers. Uh, they're coming back losing fingers, and as the Siemens Bethel uh, so um, appropriately reminds us, uh, many lives are lost in this dangerous occupation, the, the most dangerous occupation. New Bedford will once again look to uh, the sea for a renaissance, uh, whether it is the maritime port and its expansion as small freighters come in and unload, in this case, all the clementines which you buy in Montreal come via the port of New Bedford, and the reason is that you can cut two days off sale time and you can get quicker access to markets by instead of going up by the Gulf, the, um, Gulf of Lawrence, you come into New Bedford and go straight to Montreal. That's what's happening here. And of course, we hope that someday that the marine commerce terminal will indeed be active. As we look to tell our story and be relevant, and uh, we wish to share our experiences with others, we hosted the ambassador from Iceland, uh, Sarah Rose, our curator of education, organized this visit, and we're hoping to send New Bedford youth to Iceland and vice versa, kids from there will come. And they're looking to, uh, by way of education, uh, move that country uh, uh, away from whaling to uh, whale watching, and they're looking at what we're doing here as a very good example uh, to be able to tell that story. This is an active and ongoing project. So, so too, we're working with NOAA, uh, taking our logbooks and true cloud sourcing uh, and sending data to NOAA, NOAA's headquarters in uh, Seattle, in this case, one of the NOAA headquarters. Uh, they are going to take... Uh, they have Navy World War II information on what is happening in the Arctic in terms of ice pack and melt. They have World War I information from the Navy. But before that, and to interpolate, they'll be using the information from the New Bedford Whaling logbooks to try to determine and extrapolate what will happen uh, as we go through climate change and what effects that will have in the Arctic. That's an ongoing project which will be running for many years. And you may have read this in the newspaper. After World War II, uh, we weren't worried about U-boats, but we sure were worried about Russian boomer subs. Well, the problem was you couldn't tell the difference between a Russian sub with nuclear missiles off your coast and a whale. And it probably wouldn't be a good idea to shoot a torpedo at either. But uh, certainly, you don't want to shoot her at a whale. So these two chaps, Cheville and Watkins, uh, um, and the chap, uh, the chap on top is Watkins, the guy on the bottom is the spitting image of the main star in Breaking Bad. <laughs> Doesn't he? You've seen that story, isn't he? The spitting image. And this is a collection of 80,000 audio files, and the Navy used this compilation of audio files, uh, which um, uh, helped them make the uh, uh, determination, uh, uh, as a, I'm making a gross generalization here, obviously, between whale and submarine, but it was bit, somebody had to do it, and these guys started, and we're delighted to have that collection here. Now, I'm off tomorrow to Cape Verde, and this is a section of the 1,275 long panorama. It is eight feet high. We're conserving it at the moment. When Russell Purrington, and Purrington, Russell, no relation to me, and Purrington painted this in 1848, isn't it curious that here is Mount Fogo erupting? And here we have, we think about 
the Pacific Rim. We think about Hawaii and the eruptions. But look at the activity that's happened in the Atlantic, from Iceland oh, about 10 years ago, which was devastating uh, to Europe, to Capolinos, uh, there was a wave of 175,000 Azorian immigrants in 1958, 59, 60s period uh, as a result of the devastating volcano in Fayal. Here's a photograph, it, uh, photograph of it to just 2014, where Mount Fogo erupted once again uh, to devastating loss of uh, uh, property, no life. Well, I knew there'd be volunteers here, so I thought I'd better put a plug in for the marathon. We all know that story, but you don't know this story. This man is the Reverend Enoch Mudge. Ring any bells? The Reverend Enoch Mudge was the second minister of the Siemens Bethel. And if you go down below in the Siemens Bethel, you'll see a small black and white photograph. It's about eight and a half by 11. Well, the original painting is in Santa Barbara. I saw it two days ago, and it is coming to the museum within the next two years. We think it's painted by Thomas Cole. Thomas Cole was one of the founders of the Hudson River School. It's a remarkable piece. It's about two and a half by four feet. Uh, and you will see that on display possibly in here. So that's going to be terrific news. And here is a cartoon by Dave. I just love this. I want to have a book of all his cartoons printed. I just think they're absolutely terrific. <laughs> and I thought, I think I'm coming to the end of the slideshow here. This is a glorious shot of the Morgan in the foreground with the fireworks uh, going off on the 5th of July. How ironic in a way, how appropriate I suppose it'd be more important that New Bedford always was and always will be a uh, harbor uh, uh, of protection during times of uh, um, a storm. And sure enough, what happened on July 4th last year when the Morgan came in? there was a massive storm. And where would the Morgan have come if it were any other place to New Bedford? It was in the perfect place. So even though it was a tough rainy day, it was a perfect understatement for one of the, uh, underscoring of one of the key uh, uh, differentiating attributes of our harbor. And here's the fireworks on the, uh, at the Cape Verdean holiday, which is July 5th. And here's that great parade of boats with 127 boats uh, going in this crescent shape around the Morgan. Absolutely terrific. Now here's some breaking news. This is uh, something you'll hear about shortly. As a result of the Morgan's visit, the Sagres is coming on July 8th and 9th of this year, and that is the direct result of the Morgan visit. And working with the Portuguese consulate, our friend Pedro Canero, we look forward to the Sagres's visit. And I, I believe this is my closing slide. You've probably read, and this is a cautionary note to a lot of us, and I think it may affect pretty much everybody in the room, but there is some very disconcerting legislation bubbling up. Uh, it's largely driven by lobbyists, as far as I can tell, from DC, based on my experience at uh, Rhode Island State House yesterday. But uh, in an effort to protect uh, elephants, which is a very laudable cause, and uh, I think we can all have a high degree of empathy uh, towards anything which would stem the slaughter. Uh, however, an outright ban on all and every piece of ivory, including scrimshaw and uh, uh, other marine ivory, uh, antique or not, is not the answer, and yet that is what the legislation calls for. So I would uh, end by uh, encouraging you to look at that bill, and if you have uh, if you have scrimshaw or if you have ivory, it would be rendered worthless uh, if these bills go forward with their, current, uh, uh, with their current language. So on that rather somber note, I think it's the end of the show, and I'd be delighted to take some questions. So, all right. I would say that, was Brian Wachowski better? I would say, I, I'd say Brian was on top form, right? So, okay. Uh, any questions from the group? 
Come on, you got to give me a softball question, Grace. Still selling whale oil. You know, it's a really interesting question because in many ways, what do you do? I suppose, let me see, you would have three choices. One would be to, well, let's just see what your choices are. This is your business. This was the family business. This is what you've done your whole life. This is what you know how to do. Let's go out. There are more whales out there. We were just unlucky. Let's just be lucky and go out and get it. There's still a market for it. There's still a market. As you, you're just not getting as much. So there's the double down theory. That would probably be exemplified best with the Concordia, that the Howland family said, okay, let's, the Concordia was one of the best whaling vessels. I mean, it was absolutely gorgeous. Uh, and it was lost in the Arctic crush in the 1870s. But there would be a case where the family said, let's double down. You've got a decision to try to uh, move out into other markets. Uh, you're pretty good at refining. Okay, you know, we spent a uh, couple of generations refining whale oil. Why don't we go down to Titusville or go to other areas and see if our technologies for refining can be adapted and used in other industries. And then another approach would be to move out entirely. So if you look at the money, a lot of money migrated because there were two binomial peaks um, when it comes to wealth in New Bedford. The first peak was because of whaling, but it was binomial because it was also the richest city per capita as a result of textiles. So money migrated from whaling early on, as early as 1850s, you know, and before that, money was migrating to textiles. So you had choices, and who knew what the best choice was? Double down, adapt, or move into different industries altogether. No, that's ambergris, which uh, is the delightful byproduct, which is an intestinal discomfort in a sperm whale that people like to spray in their faces. So it's rather <laughs> curious. What happened? Um, it, why, why did you replace that in the first industry? I presume a synthetic. Um, does anybody know the? I'm not sure what replaced ambergris. I I presume it's a binder of some sort. Um, and and. And, and, Bob, and Bob knows the answer to that. So, um, in, in the US, it's synthetic. In other countries <coughs> that don't have a law like the Marine Mammal Protection Act, they still use it. So oh. You could get Chanel No. 5 from France. It will have Ambrian, which is the protein taken out of Ambrian. There you go. It's just like hot dogs. You're better off not knowing what's in it. <laughs> By the way, I... I see John Panero is here, so we can call him Sir John. Uh, John, I didn't realize that you were there, otherwise I wouldn't have focused in on you, but there is the, the anointed uh, uh, Prince of Portugal. <laughs> uh. Questions? Oh, have I? oh, here we are. Well, that's a good question. Now, whaling, so it, it, can you buy whale's teeth or whale product, I suppose, in Portugal, or probably the Azores uh, are more appropriate. There wasn't much whaling in Portugal, and nor in Madeira, for that matter. Uh, it was in, uh, in the Azores. Curiously enough, Azorean whaling techniques essentially mirrored uh, the Yankee uh, uh, whaling techniques. I'll answer your question in a minute, uh, but it, it, it mirrored. It didn't morph into, curiously enough, uh, it didn't morph into the Norwegian techniques, which were the bow-mounted cannon going out to get the whale. It was very much as a result of, uh, well, um, Azorian Americans repatriating to the Azores saying, hey, we know how to do this. Let's set up shore stations. There are the whales here. There was a lot of German investment in the Azores. Uh, there's a strong affinity. Uh, as a matter of fact, you can look at 
during World War II, uh, Roosevelt had plans to invade the Azores. Um, he wasn't quite sure whether Hitler was going to go south or north, and Hitler decided to go into Russia instead of Spain and Portugal. Uh, but there was a plan ready to go, and um, the uh, uh, chap in charge of Portugal at the time, Salazar, uh, he struck a deal with Churchill, and as a result of that deal, uh, uh, planes, uh, spotter planes, uh, uh, reconnaissance planes could fly out of the Azores and that cut down the German U-boat menace in 1943. It's always been an incredibly strategic group of islands. I find it very interesting from that point of view whether, uh, um, you know, whether it was a case like that in World War II where there was a direct need kind of tying Europe and uh, the U.S. together and saving many lives as a result to as recently as when Blair and Bush met in the Azores. And uh, there's a big debate at the moment uh, about an Air Force base which uh, may be closed there. The uh, base was set up during the Cold War and uh, uh, planes flew out of the island of Tessera and they were looking for um, Russian submarines. I suspect it was also used in case of a war, B-52s could possibly land there. So now to answer your question, uh, you can buy whale in the Azores. I see John nodding his head. I think you'd have a great deal of difficulty importing it. Uh, John, is that a quick summation? I think you can buy whale, whale teeth, whale bone in the Azores. I don't Uh, okay, so probably, so if it's certified that was killed before around 1980, 82 or thereabouts, then you can. So you'd want a certificate. But I would be fairly careful about bringing it into the country. Okay, more questions? Keep them coming. Can't believe Janet Whitler doesn't have a question for me. I've never seen her so quiet. No, there are umpteen federal laws. Um, there are umpteen federal laws. This is purely a matter of um, a demagogue's drum, in my opinion. Um, I think it's got a lot more to do with exciting the masses, and I know a thing or two about fundraising, and I think really what's going on here is let's get folks very excited about this particular issue. There are about five or six federal laws uh, which uh, fail. There are certainly loopholes. But enforcement is the big issue. And uh, uh, we like, we say that it's akin to if you own a car and somebody was importing cars, and uh, in order to stop that person from importing cars or to create a disincentive, what we're going to do is render the value of your car worthless, and therefore they're not going to import the car. It's, it's that goofy. Uh, it's just such a bludgeoning approach. It's a, it's a zealous approach. Um, quite honestly, when it comes to zealotry and extremism on the far right or far left, I'd be extremely worrisome. And we just need to look at the destruction of the statues, the Buddhist statues in Afghanistan, or, or just only last month where the ISIS was tipping over sculptures in museum in the Middle East to see that when you take causes to an extreme without basing them uh, uh, within a culture, and the very thought that you would destroy your cultural uh, patrimony is, uh, is, is quite alarming and shocking. But that's just my personal opinion. <laughs>